All right, it's great to come to you tonight uh, through live stream. And we're going to be looking in John chapter 15. Uh, we're going to share a message entitled Abiding in Christ out of John chapter 15. And while you're opening your Bibles up there, I just want to remind you uh, to tune in on Sunday at 9.30. We'll have a discussion panel. Uh, we've been asking for some questions. I uh, haven't really seen any questions yet. Uh, but we're planning on uh, going through a passage of scripture and expounding that, talking about it. So you'd be praying with us as we prepare for Sunday at 930, the discussion panel. And then, of course, our preaching time will be at uh, 10 a.m. And so uh, God's been very good to us to be able to continue to communicate the word of God with each other. And uh, the things that you're hearing, if someone's not watching, be sure to pass it on and share it with someone else. And I know God will uh, speak to your heart and someone else's heart in a great way also. Remember to go on our website, ocbcministries.org, and on the tab across the top it says Our Church. Click that tab on, scroll down, and you'll find our prayer sheet. And so make sure you take some time through the week. Uh, certainly tonight, uh, as a church, we can be, even though we're not together, be praying together. And uh, with, uh, interceding at the throne of grace for those that are in need. So be sure you get that prayer sheet. Make sure you pray through. And I know God will uh, not just speak to your heart, but will work in the lives of others also. Uh, so our message tonight, Abiding in Christ, out of John chapter 15. And we'll begin reading in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Uh, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he pr uh, purgeth it, uh, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and, with, and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, and so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Uh, let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much for allowing us to have the word of God in front of us this evening. Uh, it is a joy to be able to study and uh, ponder the scriptures, uh, meditating on the word of God, and Lord, comprehending not just what it says, but just allowing it to settle into our very heart and being to where it makes a difference, a change in us. Uh, we pray, Lord, for just an anointing of God on the preaching of the word tonight. Uh, send thy Holy Spirit upon us. May the Spirit of God be our teacher and guide through the word to this evening. And may he point our hearts towards Christ. And may we understand how important, how significant it is for us to abide in Christ. And so bless the preaching of the word of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text verse is verse 7. It tells us, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. What a powerful, powerful passage of scripture. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. This is a great chapter. It's a great discourse that Jesus Christ is sharing with his disciples. Uh, we know this is prior to his crucifixion. It is literally a discourse that was given at the end of the Last Supper that Jesus would have with his disciples. 
it is a great challenge to his disciples to help them to continue on in the relationship with Christ. We certainly know that as we look back in history, we read the Gospels that the disciples were scattered when Jesus was betrayed and he was taken captive. And so Jesus has given this great challenge to the disciples to help them uh, when they would be facing these great trials. They were in danger of abandoning Christ. You know, it's, a, it's always interesting to see how quickly people are ready to abandon their faith uh, when trials and difficulties come. And so Jesus is reminding his disciples in order for them to not succumb to the danger of a, abandoning him, he says, you need to abide in me, so we stay in Christ. He was also giving this discourse that challenged them about the failure to support one another. You know, tragedies have a tendency to cause us to abandon Christ, but they also have a, a, a challenge and a problem for us in that it's very easy for us to fail to support one another when trials are going on. Uh, we get so focused on ourselves, we're so concerned about our own uh, difficulties uh, that we forget that there are others who are suffering also. We often want to complain about our circumstances and situations in life, but I have found this, there is always somebody else who has it worse off than what I have, no matter how bad it is. And so this chapter is a means through which you can be helped not to abandon or neglect support of one another. If we abide in Christ, then he'll be with us and he'll help us. And so he's given this challenge because of the danger of abandoning Christ. He's given this challenge because of the failure to support each other. And he's giving this challenge because of the possibility of them forgetting the call of God upon their life. Jesus came along the shore and they saw the disciples. He said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He put a very specific call upon the life of each of those disciples. And now as he's observed the Last Supper with them, uh, and he's about ready to be betrayed and taken prisoner, he wants to remind them, you must abide in me because without me, you're not going to make it. If you're not abiding in me, you'll forget all about the call of God in on your life. And we saw that as we studied uh, John chapter 21. And Peter said, I go a fishing. And all the disciples said, we go with thee very easily, very quickly. They have abandoned Christ. They have failed to support each other. And they have forgotten God's call in their life. And so how significant this concept is, this thought process that we must abide in Christ. This chapter is about our productivity and our fellowship in Christ. Literally, he says, without me, you can do nothing. So without Christ, there is no productivity. There is no success. There is no victory without Christ. But beyond that, there's not just no prospering without Christ. There's no fellowship without Christ. You understand that our common denominator that we have <clears throat> that binds us together as a body of believers is our faith in Jesus Christ. And if we're not abiding in Christ, our fellowship breaks down. Our productivity breaks down. Our abilities to be able to be successful is gone. And so Jesus tells them, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Remember, Israel had to suffer this matter of being cut off. When God was with his people, they would experience great blessings and great moves of God. When they would disobey God and they would forget their God, and they refused to abide in God, uh, they would suffer great losses. In Isaiah chapter, 50, uh, chapter 5 and verse 1, I'll just read a few verses for you here. In Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, Now, when I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard, my well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. 
And so Isaiah is acknowledging the fact that as our chapter here talks about Jesus is the true vine and the father is the husband men, Israel was referred to as the vineyard of God, of God. And that now literally uh, there was uh, God's blessings and fruit that would be established and experienced as Israel would be in fellowship with God. That's what Isaiah is talking about in chapter five, but in Hosea chapter 10 and verse one, says Israel is an empty vine. Oh my, there's something that changed. There's something that happened. They were to be fruitful. They were on a fruitful hill and God was their husband. They were the vine of God and Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars. According to the goodness of his land, they have made goodly images. Israel still had God as the husbandman, the one who was in charge of the vineyard, but their vines are empty. And that's why Zechariah chapter three and verse eight prophesies, hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. See, God refers to Israel as being his vineyard in which there was a vine that was fruitful, but the fruit was gone because they abandoned their God. And because they have abandoned their God, they became a vine that was empty. And so God said, I will send the true vine. I will send the branch of Israel. And we know that is in fulfillment uh, was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's why when Jesus is talking to his disciples prior to his crucifixion, he reminds them that, wait a minute, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman because he wants to bring them in remembrance of that relationship that God had with his people Israel. And now we'll experience that relationship within the church of Jesus Christ. This chapter uh, in this chapter, eight times the word fruit is used. You know, when God repeats something, we ought to listen to what he has to say. Amen. And notice in verse two, it says, in every branch in me that bringeth not fruit, says he taketh away in every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. So three times in that verse two, Jesus is speaking in regards to the expectations of the vine and the vine or the branches that would come out from him were to be producing fruit. And then in verse six, he says it again, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit. So the expectation is there's a bearing of fruit, but the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the true vine. That's why verse five says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. So here we go from no fruit to some fruit to much fruit, depending on a relationship of being in the vine as the branch that we might be able to produce the fruit that God desires. And then in verse uh, eight, he says, here it is my father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. Then all the way down in verse 16, he says, he have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever he asks of the father in my name he may give it you. Eight times, eight times, he had mentions the product of abiding in Christ is fruit. I see another thing here, another word that is used here, the word abide. The word abide is used nine times in this chapter. And uh, as fruit means to produce uh, whatever it may be, abide, abide, uh, abide means to be connected with or engrafted in. And it's used nine times. Notice in verse four, he says, abide in me and I in you. 
In verse four, he says, except you abide in me. You can do no, uh, 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 no more can ye except ye abide in me. And uh, verse five, he tells us, he that abideth in me. In verse six, he says, if any man abide not in me. Verse seven, if ye abide in me, my words abide in you. And in verse 10, he says, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. And so certainly it is clear to see that the emphasis of this discourse to encourage the disciples to continue on wraps itself around the concept of abiding in Christ and producing fruit. The natural outflow or experience of abiding in Christ is that there will be fruit in our life. I like what Jonathan Edwards said. Uh, he described it in this chapter. He described it as this matter of abiding and experiencing fruit. He described it as a calm, sweet abstraction of soul from all the concerns of this world. And sometimes a kind of vision or fixed idea of being alone in the mountain or some solitary wilderness far from all mankind, sweetly conversing with Christ and wrapped and swallowed up in God. When Jesus is speaking to his disciples about abiding in Christ and producing fruit, he is approaching the concept that everything that you are is consumed in the reality of all that Christ is. Because if there is one area in my life that is not consumed with Christ, it'll be an area that becomes unprotect, un uh, 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 um, fruitful and uh, unproductive. Forgot the word I was gonna say, unproductive. Matthew Henry in his commentary on this chapter said this chapter can be divided up in the following ways. He said, you can divide it up as verses one through eight as dealing with fruit. Uh, he said verses nine through 17 deals with love. Verses 18 through 25 deals with hatred. And verses 26 and 27 deals with the comforter. Now it all begins and it's all experienced based on the biting in Christ so as to produce fruit. You cannot produce the love of Christ if you're not abiding in Christ. You cannot overcome the hatred of man if you're not abiding in Christ. And it is for certain it is the Holy Spirit of God that gives us the ability to, to comprehend and experience the fullness of all that Christ is in our life. So abiding in Christ. You know, Psalm 80 and 8 said, Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. You know, when Jesus, I mean, when God brought the Israel out of uh, Egypt, he literally brought them into Canaan land, drove the enemy out and planted Israel on that land. So much controversy over who owns the land in the Middle East and so many controversial things with different nations around about Israel. But the reality is, it is God who planted Israel in that spot. And Israel was the vine that God planted with the expectation that they would be fruitful. And out of that vine, we are aware of the fact that the branch came through the tribe of Judah the Lord Jesus Christ, and listen, we are planted in Christ in the church of Jesus Christ. And because we are planted or engrafted in the true vine, then we have the ability to be productive or fruitful in our Christian life. So let's look at this subject, this topic of abiding in Christ. Notice, first of all, I see that there's a conscious cleansing a conscious cleansing in verses one through three. A conscious cleansing in reference to the fact he is the source of life. In verse one, it says, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman." And so if you're going to be able to experience a real cleansing that takes place, the source of that life 
is based on the fact of who Jesus Christ is. Uh, Jesus is the true vine, and his father is the husbandman. In other words, Christ is the one that's planted, and God is the one who cultivates. Uh, God is the one who cares. Literally, as the fact is that Jesus, uh, the father is the husbandman, it means that he is the owner. In Psalm 24, verse 1, it says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. Uh, I want you to know tonight uh, that because of the fact that the Father is the husbandman, that means everything in every person in this world is owned by God. People say, well, I don't want to know about God. I don't want to know about how to be saved. I'm not interested in those things. It doesn't matter whether you're interested or not. God owns you. And uh, that's why the son, the true vine, came into this world to be able to provide a way for man to experience the reality of God. And so he is the true vine. So the father is the owner. The son is the vine. And so Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And because Christ is the true vine and we're engrafted in Christ and we can abide in Christ, so now we can literally do whatever it is that we desire to do for the glory of God. That, listen, if God be for us, who can stand against us? And that is based on not our ability or our strengths or our understanding, it is based on the reality everything that I am is found in Christ Jesus. In Galatians, in chapter 4, in verse 7, it says, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You know, I, I, I enjoyed being on a farm when I grew up. And I enjoyed planting gardens years ago. And I stopped doing gardens because I got tired of feeding the squirrels. And uh, everything I planted, the squirrels uh, would eat. Uh, when a squirrel was sitting in the tree with one of my tomatoes and threw it at me, that's when I said, that's enough. I'm not growing any more tomatoes or anything else in the garden. I'm going to stop gardening. And that's pretty bad when they're stealing your food and they throw it at you. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, wasn't, I don't even know what I was going to say now. Oh, uh, everything that we have, everything that we can enjoy is based on a God giving the increase in that garden. That garden could be planted, uh, but when that garden, whatever you planted, that's what grew. You didn't plant tomatoes to expect to uh, harvest peppers. You didn't plant corn and expect to be able to harvest peas. Whatever you plant, that's what pr is produced. And so if we are planted in Christ, if we're grafted into Christ, then it is a natural process through which we will blossom into being a Christian and God can mold us into the image of his own son. But if we're not going to live our life grafted in Christ, conscious of the fact that God is the one who does the cleansing, that God is the one who gives the life through Christ, uh, then certainly we're never going to be plugged into the resources of life. But I see not only the resource of life, but I see the process of life in verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. In every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. The process of life. Notice it's a mutual expectation. In verse 2, he says every branch. The expectation of God is that every branch may produce fruit. And, uh, and so we, we often think of Acts chapter 10 and verse 34, God is no respecter of persons. In other words, God does not expect something out of me that he does not expect out of you. God is no respecter of persons. We think of Luke chapter 10 and verse 2, when Jesus is speaking about the harvest is great and the laborers few. He says, pray ye the Lord of the harvest that it might send laborers into the field. The expectation of sending a labor in the field was not for them to come back empty handed. The expectation of the labor going in the field was for them to come back with fruit. 
that would abound to their account. And so there is a process of life to where God's expectations upon us is that we might be fruitful. Why? Because he said, if there's no fruit, then uh, take it away. And because of the fact it is not producing life, uh, then it is no value to me. <clears throat> now, the sad thing is that you can preach someone to preach someone the gospel of Christ and they won't respond to the gospel of Christ. They're not producing any fruit. They're not experiencing any fruit. They're lost. What's going to happen to them? They'll be cast out. They'll be cast into the lake of fire. Uh, many a believer, I believe, uh, will suffer loss because of the fact that they're not being fruitful in their life. Uh, certainly, uh, well, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 deals with that, a matter of standing before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, many scriptures tell us in the word of God that God expects us to produce fruit, and if we don't ex uh, produce the fruit, then uh, we're uh, literally taken out and uh, thrown out with the tormentors. And so we, the mutual expectation is that each one of us may be bearing fruit. You say, well, I just don't have that ability. I don't have that experience. Well, it's not about you. It's about whether or not you're grafted in the true vine. And so the process of life, there's a mutual expectation, but there's also a multiplied expectation. Because it says here, every branch that's mutual in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that's mutual that beareth fruit, he purges it that it might bring forth more fruit. You know, you go down and you drive through the country and you look at different areas where orchards are. And in the springtime, you'll see that there'll be all kinds of piles of sticks and branches that are piled up. Those sticks and branches are simply branches uh, that the trimmers come through and cut off because they have become unproductive. And the only way for that tree, whether it's an apple tree or whether it's a peach tree, the only way for that tree to blossom and come to the full volition of what it's Ability is to be fruitful is that the dead branches have to be cut off and then that, that uh, fruit, uh, tree becomes, uh, comes alive. My wife has these, uh, I don't know what they are, kind of like flower things out in the front of our house by our porch. And every year they get all brown and they're all uh, ugly looking and everything. And I used to watch and different uh, shoots would come up through there and everything and it hit me. The problem with these things is they need to be cut down. And what I do is early in the spring, I go in with my weed whacker and I cut all those things out. I cut them all the way down to the ground. And within two to three weeks, a whole new batch, batch that's brighter and greener and fuller uh, grows up and it's beautiful the rest of the summer. Why? Because that which was dead had to be purged and it had to be removed so now that plant can produce fruit. And that's what God does in our life. God will prune us. He'll cut those dead branches, those dead experiences out of our life so that we might be fruitful. Paul says in Colossians chapter one and verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. If I'm not increasing in the knowledge of God, then I've got some dead branches on me. If I'm not increasing in the knowledge of God, I'm not becoming fruitful in every area of my life. And so I need God to purge me so that I might be ready to become more fruitful as a Christian because I want to abide in Christ. I want that source of life to flow through me that it might produce fruit in others. Notice in Colossians chapter two and verse 18, Paul says, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worship, ping, uh, worship, <laughs> worshiping, uh, it's not ping pong here, amen. <laughs> worshiping of angels, introducing into those things which you have not seen vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding the head 
from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases in the uh, knowledge of God. Uh, increases, I'm sorry, increases with the increase of God. It says, wherefore, if you be dead with Christ for the rudiments of this world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not. And so he's challenging the Colossian believers that don't allow the things of this world to capture your mind, which are dead to God. The rudiments of this world have no life and no fruit. And so be multiplied in your fruitfulness and understanding the process of life. If you're in Christ and you bear not fruit, then there'll be a purging that will take place. And God purges us so that we might be able to bear more fruit. So there's a cleansing. There's a conscious cleansing that God works in our life. Notice not only the resource of life, the process of life, but there's the power of life in verse three. It says, now are you clean through the word which I have spoken unto you? There is a spoken word. This is a matter of uh, uh, thy word. Sanctify them through thy word, it says in John 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so this experiencing the power of God to be cleansed uh, by the spoken word. You know, Paul tells us over in Romans, the instruction of God's word in Romans chapter 7 in uh, dealing with oftentimes people say, well, I'm not a sinner. I don't know. I don't like it when people say you're sinners. Well, you know, the word of God tells us that. It instructs us that. In Romans 7, 7, it says, what shall we say then? Is it, is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the Lord said, thou shalt not covet. And so there is the spoken cleansing uh, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. There's the instructive cleansing that takes place. God identifies what is right and just. He identifies what is sinful and wrong. And then there's their interactive cleansing in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I see this abiding in Christ begins with a conscious cleansing. We must be in Christ. We must be grafted into the true vine. And so there's a conscious cleansing that takes place. Uh, literally, I, I've read this quote, to abide in Christ is a conscious experience. Oftentimes people say, well, I'm not sure if I'm saved or not. Uh, you might not be saved. Because there is a conscious experience that you are saved when you trust the Lord because you are engrafted into the true vine. You become one with Christ. And so a conscious cleansing. In verse 4 through 7, I see a continuous abiding. In verse 4 through 7. Notice in verse 4, there's a command and a promise. Abide in me and I in you. That's a, that's a command and a promise. He so states the subject of the sentence is you being understood. He literally is saying, you abide in me. And so that's a command. But the promise is you abide in me and I in you. And so the reality is this conscious abiding, continuous abiding is based on the fact of me responding to the command of God, knowing that when I respond to his command, he has made a promise that he would be in me. And so this mutual type of existence and experience, one with another, a command and a promise. Notice in verse four also, there's a surrender and control. In verse four, he says, abide in me, and I in you. And then he says, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. And so here's the surrender. You can't bear fruit unless you abide in Christ. I've got to surrender to Christ. And as I surrender to Christ, he reminds us, it is not based about you, 
but rather it's he abiding in us. So our surrender to Christ in abiding in Christ is that I release all control of myself to Jesus Christ. And it is, it is the, the, uh, the root or the trunk of the uh, vine that brings all the minerals and all the strength and all the life uh, to the branch that is engrafted in it. Because once you cut that branch off, you say, well, I'm, I don't want to be a part of that trunk. I don't want to be a part of that tree. Uh, once you disconnect from that, your all, whole life, your whole resources and strength is gone. And so he tells us there's a surrender to the control of God. Verse five, look what it says. It's positive and purpose. In verse five, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So it's positive and it's also purpose. And there's an emphatic announcement in verse five. I am the vine. That's not a passive statement. It's an emphatic statement. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. And so I find a positive relationship uh, based on the fact of the emphatic announcement of Jesus Christ. As Galatians 5, 16, Paul says, if you walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, Literally, Jesus is saying this, if you're in me, the true vine, you understand you're the branches, then you'll produce fruit. So it's positive and purpose. It's emphatic announcement, and it's an enjoyed relationship. He says, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. I, I thought, right away, I thought about Psalm 126. And, uh, and verse 5 and 6 of Psalm 126. And uh, if I can see with my glasses here, I'll find that verse for you. But Psalm 126 in verse 5 and 6 says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. See, it's an enjoyable relationship because as you are grafted in Christ, the life, the fruit, the process of God working in your life produces life in someone else. And so there is this matter of, of enjoyed relationship. Notice in verse six, here's what happens if there's a failure to abide in Christ. In verse six, he says, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. And so literally he tells us the failure to abide simply ends up being equal to destruction. In 1 John chapter two, in verse 19, 1 John chapter two, verse 19, says, uh, they went out from us because they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would not, no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not at all of us. And so John warns us of the danger of not abiding in Christ. They went out, they fell by the wayside. Uh, they had no future in glorifying God because they were never a part of the body of Christ to begin with. And so failure to abide equals destruction in your life. And I watched so many people over the years uh, literally lose their lives as far as uh, being fruitful or being influential or being uh, uh, respected because of the fact that they had failed in abiding in Christ. So failure to abide equals destruction. Verse seven, fullness in abiding equals answered prayer. Notice in verse seven, it says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, 
Ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. And I've had people say, well, you don't understand. I Well, you know, it, it just may not be the will of God, or uh, God's not going to answer every prayer. We kind of put disclaimers on our prayers. Well, wait a minute. It tells us if you abide in Christ and it, he is in you, then whatever you ask, in accordance with his will, he'll do it. And so let's not try to explain God's ability to move in our life away uh, because maybe we're not getting the answer in prayer as quickly as we think we ought to be getting it. Mm -hmm. Good. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Fullness of abiding in Christ is the experience, the answer of prayer in our life. Then I see the Father is glorified by abiding in verse 8. Here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. And so the abiding the Father being glorified in our abiding would equal discipleship. He says, because you, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. And the challenge that Jesus was giving to his disciples was, uh, he did not want them to fall by the wayside in fear because of the trial that he would be facing and the death he would ex experience but rather he wanted them to understand that God the Father is glorified by us abiding in Christ. Because by abiding in Christ, then we can produce fruit and uh, it equals discipleship. I like what John Piper said about this. He said, uh, uh, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Oftentimes, we're not living a life being abiding in Christ because we're not satisfied with God. We think that we need something else. We think that we deserve something else when all we, all we need is Jesus and Jesus alone. Thus, Christ is not simply invited to help in the time of need. I'm afraid we have missed out on this so many times. Because we approach God like he's a welfare check. We approach God like he's a physician that has to bow to my medical insurance. We, we so many times approach God as if uh, he is nothing more than one that actively gets involved in my life when I ask him to or tell him to. But in all reality, Christ is not simply invited to help in the time of need. He is the one who is constantly acknowledged as the resource of life itself. He is not just the foundation, but rather he is the very course by which we live. That's what abiding in Christ is. He's not a whim. He's not something we connect with when we feel lonely, but rather he is literally everything that I am and everything that I need because he's beyond the foundation. He's the course of life also. Right. Abiding in Christ. So we see abiding in Christ. This whole concept of conscious cleansing. We're engrafted in Christ as we are cleansed. Continuous abiding. We abide in Christ as we continue to walk with him. And then the last thing in verse 9 through 11 I see the compassionate loving. In verse 9, notice a demonstrated love. And the Father hath loved me, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. A demonstrated love. The world has no concept about what love is. The world's concept of love is some perverted type of relationship. The world's concept of love is a selfish love that demands something to be done for them all the time. The demonstrated love of God is as God the Father loved Jesus, that's the way he has loved us. 
And so we are to continue in that love that he has for us here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Right. So the way we can comprehend real love is by abiding in Christ. So it's a demonstrated love. Verse 10 is a determined love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. That's a determination. Jesus would say, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so uh, evidences of abiding in Christ is a compassionate love that's on my heart that's not just talking about loving God, but loving one another because of the demonstration of the love had, of the father had with the son but it goes beyond that, that I determine, I determine to keep his commandments because by keeping his commandments, I show that I love them. You say, well, a man can't keep his commandments. That's absolutely right. That's why you abide in Christ. And then verse 11, I see a delightful love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Can I just interject here a thought that maybe, maybe, just maybe why Christians aren't happy is because we're not abiding in Christ. Because the love that God has demonstrated to us and the love that Christ has determined to be for us is so designed that as we are abiding in Christ that the joy, God's joy, he didn't say that your joy, People always say, well, I'm just not happy anymore. It's not about whether you're happy or not. Yep. You abide in Christ. He said, I have spoken unto you that my joy, my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Notice before your joy can be full, his joy must remain in you. Before your joy will be an exciting, exuberant experience. There must be that ever abiding, continuous, compassionate love of God that is abiding in us as we abide in Christ, a delightful love. C.S. Lewis said this, he shook my dozing soul through the cold water of reality in my face. You think about that. He shook my dozing soul and threw the cold water of reality in my face so that the life and God and heaven and hell broke into my world with glory and horror. I really believe now we need the, the spiritual water of God to be smacked in our face because we have slumbered. We have become lukewarm. We have disconnected with God. We have fallen asleep. God needs to splash the water, the living water on our face to wake us up to the reality of who God is and what heaven is and what hell is. And yes, there's glory in God, but there's terror in hell. And these disciples are about ready to go through a terror in their life that they never knew could be so horrible. And Jesus approaches them and speaks to them and tells them, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Saints of God, abide in Christ. Walk with your God. Surrender your life to him completely. Be consumed with the reality of all that God is. And whatever you ask, in accordance with his will, it shall be done. I'm thankful tonight that there's a God in heaven who longs to be in us, who longs to abide in us. 
because his abiding in us enables us to abide in him. And I'm thankful for this great promise that Jesus gave his disciples. As we get ready to pray in just a moment, I want to remind you to take time and look at our prayer sheet. Be praying for those that are on that sheet. As you abide in Christ, lift up their names before the throne of grace. As you remember their suffering, enter into that suffering with them with a compassionate heart of lifting their name before the throne of grace. We can't do it on our own. We can't accomplish anything without our God, but we can abide in Christ and he'll abide in us. And the experience we have with our, with our Savior is the same experience he had with his Father in heaven abiding in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for your love tonight. We're thankful for uh, the truth that is in the scriptures. God, we desperately, so desperately need uh, a move of God, a touch from God from heaven. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would impress upon us, wake us up, stir our soul, ignite a fire in us, Lord, uh, that we might Surrender ourselves completely and live abiding in Jesus Christ. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.